Time to take your wealth to the next level. Welcome to Learn Wealthy, your go-to channel for real estate insights, market charts, and golden opportunity. Let's build wealth together. How's it going, everyone? Hope y'all are doing great. Today's episode is going to be juicy. Today, we're going to talk about VP Kamala Harris's economic plan. I don't want this channel to be political, but at the end of the day, what matters to us Americans is that we can have, we can live better lives, right? It's why... We talk about finance, real estate, and economics, not just for money. Money is just a tool to have better lives. I want this channel to be non-biased politically, so I placed a link down below of her full speech so you can watch it yourself. But I'm also going to highlight things that she said that matters to me. And it's basically what she focused on. Many of the big food companies are seeing their highest profits in two decades. And while many grocery chains pass along these savings, others still aren't. Look, I know most businesses are creating jobs, contributing to our economy, and playing by the rules. But some are not. And that's just not right. And we need to take action when that is the case. At As Attorney General in California, I went after companies that illegally increased prices, including wholesalers that inflated the price of prescription medication, and companies that conspired with competitors to keep prices of electronics high. I won more than $1 billion for consumers. So believe me, as president, I will go after the bad actors. And I will work to pass the first ever federal ban on price gauging on food. My plan will include new penalties for opportunistic companies that exploit crises and break the rules. She said a lot of things that sounds good, like most politicians should, but she focused on one thing, lowering the cost of things. She said it beautifully, unlike most of her speech where she just basically just rambles nonsense. But no matter how you say it, she is proposing price control. She's promising price control in order to lower prices of goods and to improve our lives. Technically, she is in a position of power now, especially that our president is most like, mostly MIA. She can do a lot of things as a VP to set things right. Whatever she's promising as president, she can do them now, right now, if she really wanted to. Why do 90% of our viewers keep coming back? Because they don't want to miss a thing. If you're loving what you're learning, make sure to hit that subscribe button and join our awesome community. We drop new, exciting content regularly that's designed to keep you ahead of the curve. All right, here's how the economy has been doing since she's been in position. So let's start at 2020. Um, as you can see, this is employed full-time median weekly nominal earnings, wage and salary workers 16 years and over. So wages has been going up. Oh, oh, so sorry. This is nominal earnings. Nominal means not adjusted for inflation. Because yeah, you can keep increasing your income, your wages, but let's say you have a 2% raise, but inflation is 4%. So your real raise adjusted for inflation is really negative 2%. So you have to adjust your earning based on inflation. So if inflation is a lot faster than your rate, than your income increase, you're really getting a weaker and, and worse quality of life. So here it is, employed full-time, real earnings, real means adjusted for inflation, of wage 16 years and over. This is the FRED chart, by the way, it's, it's from the Federal Reserves. So this is not tinfoil hat chart, this is from the government themselves. So from 2020, when, um, when Biden and Kamala started to be in position, the income against wages just against inflation the income against inflation just started falling 
badly. And that's why everybody's complaining that everything is unaffordable and that is not a conspiracy tinfoil hat theory. Like, I know the, the, the mainstream media is saying the government, the, the market is booming because, because of the stock market. But like I said, according to the Buffett indicator, the stock market is, is nearly twice the size of the U.S. economy. And the stock market is not a representation of the real economy. Real economy is you and I, the average Joe and Jane. The average Joe just getting by and average Jane, I need a main because I can't afford it. So, yep. Yeah. So this is what's been happening on real wages. Real means adjusted for inflation. This keeps just tanking through the Biden and Harris administration. What about real adjusted for inflation? Real, real median household income. Median household income adjusted to inflation. Tanks, tanks since 2020. Boop. But how does inflation really work? What is this thing called inflation? And where does it come from? Who or what is causing it? Editor, I need you to show my whiteboard video presentation to my learned wealthy community where they'll get a glimpse of my beautiful and artistic drawings and handwriting. All right, so let's talk about how inflation works. Imagine we are in an island to make things uh, more simpler. There's your uh, trees. As you can see, uh, there's a tree um, and there's your island. You got water here, all right? Let's have a simple, simplified economy here. As you can see from my beautiful drawing. Um, so we got a few people in the economy. All right. And they have their own specialties. This guy is really good at making coconuts. This guy or girl or according to today's standards, never mind. This guy is really good at fishing. Let's draw a fish right there. So we got an awesome fish right there. And this guy is your politician. <laughs> Let's put a politician to make it more fun. This is your bureaucrat. Let's put a big B there for bureaucrat. All right. Let's add another person. This guy is really good at catching animals and um, selling meat. This guy is the meat guy. Meat. All right, we got coconut, and that's a fish guy, and we got a politician. So, let's say without without the um, without the fish guy, without fish, without coconut, without meat, and all you have in this island, it's a lot of money. We got billions of dollars, only to, for for all four of them to share. We got billions of dollars. Does that billions of dollars? Will that billion of dollars make? Uh, is that any valuable to any of these people in this island? Will that feed them? Will this billions of dollars provide them water, or or anything at all? Will that sustain this economy? Will that sustain this little society right here? No, it won't, because money. Money is not wealth. Well, what wealth is are these fishes. The coconut, they could probably give them uh, some, some juice or some water. And then the meat, so they can have protein to survive, right? So, um, ideally, without this uh, dollars, without the money, they can just barter with each other. Let's say it's so much easier to get coconuts than, ha than uh, get fish. So this person can get uh, three fishes for five coconuts. And then it's even harder to catch animals. So this person only can get like one meat, one piece of meat. That's your steak right there. Very good drawing. Um, 
So we can get one meat for every three fishes this guy gets and for every five coconuts this guy gets, all right? And they can trade that. That's how much they produce and that's how much they, they circulate. This guy, politician, just kind of watches and uh, he's not, he doesn't have a lot of power yet. Small government. Wait, wait a second, because he is now, this politician is now plotting his evil schemes. So he just lets them trade free market capitalism, right? So they do fair trade, they all work, they all work hard, they trade, right? Suddenly, money comes along to make it convenient, right? And now, because of this balance that it takes three fishes to, for this guy to produce, um, it takes as much effort for this guy to produce three fishes and for this guy to produce five coconuts and for this guy to produce one meat. So they kind of make their, their own economy that now they're gonna use money to represent what they're selling. And because of that, scarcity of how much is getting produced they can set the price so the price is set by the market by the actual supply and demand the law of supply and demand by the actual market but now this politician comes along and uh, say i'm gonna dictate how much this price is i'm gonna dictate the prices of of how much this is this fish is going to be in coconut and meat and I want this, uh, let's say there's a total money of five, fifty dollars right? $50. So there's three fishes and then um, coconut. Basically, the money supply is uh, $50. This 50 currencies in dollars will compete, will compete on all these goods and services that's getting produced. But if you increase the money supply to $5,000, the actual wealth in the society did not increase. There's still same amount of fishes, there's still amount, same amount of coconuts, there's still same amount of meat. What only increased is the money supply. People did not get richer, all right? But now more dollar currencies are competing for that same amount of goods which now, now the abundance of dollars will dictate that this fish costs more dollars because now we just have more, more dollars to give in society. So now coconut is gonna be sold for more dollars because dollars is easily accessible, right? But the price of goods, the, the things that the people really need to survive, they didn't increase. And now this politician can increase the numbers of dollars. How will this, in how will this politician now cause inflation? They can, he can either, this politician can either increase the numbers of dollars, which, which what we saw back in 2020. No, it's not a tinfoil hat thing. It's in the Federal Reserve's website, all right? Um, or this politician can now limit the production of these goods, all right? What we want for de deflation is more goods competing for fewer dollars. And what caused inflation is less goods competing. Less goods competing for more dollars. All right. I hope you enjoyed my beautiful handwriting and my beautiful drawings. Um, let's get back to the studio. So here's a more simple illustration. So you got these goods, you got three fishes, five coconuts and two meats, total of 10 goods, right? So if the money supply is $20, then you got $20 competing against only 10 goods. Uh, that means $6 can be allocated to fishes, which will make it $2 per fish and $10 can be allocated to coconuts, which is which will make it $2 per coconut, and $4 can be allocated to meat, which will make it $2 per meat, which will make it four, and six, 10, and four will total to $20 money supply. The allocation pricing doesn't have to be like that. It depends on the need 
of the if, it depends on how much people need fish it depends on how much people need coconut and how much people need chicken or meat um the pricing doesn't have to be like two dollars for for three fish or two dollars for five coconuts it depends on how much people need fish coconut and meat but this is just an example that you have twenty dollars competing over 10 amounts 10 10 goods and if you increase the money supply now it's $100 without increasing the amount of goods. $100 is now competing against only 10 goods. Now you can allocate $30 in the system. You have $30 can, can be allocated on fishes while $50 can be allocated on coconuts and $20 can be allocated on meat. And that allocation can be moved around depends on how much people need these goods. So that's a simple illustration of why inflation happens so as you can see we are at the federal reserve chart the m2 money supply this is our currently our circulating money supply inside the united states uh coming from um extremely liquid money like cash or uh or bank checking and savings to not so liquid money supply but this is basically all our money supply inside the United States. Um, so as you can see, from 2020 all the way to 2022, again, Biden's administration, Biden and Kamala, they increased the money supply from about 15,000, 15,400 to 21,700. So basically about 30% of the money supply has been created on that short period of time from 15,400 all the way to 21,700. And not only we increased money supply, I've heard some people that, oh, printing money on the on the left side of the uh, politics oh printing money is, is is a is a hoax it has been debunked we're not print the government doesn't print money they care about us <laughs> so again not my chart not my opinion straight from the government website themselves federal reserves this is their chart that they increase the money supply all right so <clears throat> um yeah, not only they increased the money supply at that time, but one particular party also pushed for masks and lockdowns and closing of everything. Closing of all businesses, most businesses, sorry. Most businesses, which led to less production of goods. So you got so much more money and then tank the production of goods. And which is which what placed the economy on its current condition, which which put all the Americans in the situation where where it is right now. Now that we have a decent idea on how money supply, goods and services and how inflation works, let's talk about price controls. Let's break it down. Price controls. They sound like a great idea, right? The government steps in to set prices and make life more affordable for everybody. But. What if I told you that price controls have a history of not only failing, but also causing severe damage to society? Today, we're going to explore why price controls don't work and how they've led to economic disasters throughout history. Before we dive into the historical examples, let's quickly define what price controls are. Price controls are government-imposed limits on the prices that can be charged for goods and services. They typically come in two forms, price ceilings, and which set the maximum price and price floors, which set the minimum price. Sounds simple, right? But the economic reality is far more complex. Let's see how these seemingly good intentions have backfired throughout history. Let's start with one of the earliest and most famous examples, the Edict of Diocletian in ancient Rome around 301 AD. Facing rampant inflation in a crumbling economy, Emperor Diocletian issued an 
edict that imposed strict price controls on a wide range of goods and services. The idea was to curb inflation and ensure affordable prices for everyone. But what happened? The edict failed miserably. Merchants couldn't make a profit at the controlled prices, leading to widespread shortages. That's a key word, shortages. Many resorted to black market trade where goods were sold at much higher prices. The penalty for breaking the price control laws? Death. Yet, the law was so unenforceable that it was largely ignored, and the Roman economy continued its downward spiral. Fast forward to the French Revolution. In the late 18th century, the revolutionary government facing severe food shortages and hyperinflation introduced the Law of the Maximum in 1793. This law set maximum prices for essential goods like bread, grain, and meat. The result? The law exacerbated the shortages. Shortages again! Farmers and producers couldn't cover their cost at the government set prices leading them to reduce production or stop selling their goods altogether. Once again, the black market thrived and the law became nearly impossible to enforce. The social unrest escalated and the law was eventually abandoned in 1794, but not before contributing to the chaos of the reign of terror. Now let's jump onto the 20th century with a more recent example. Rent control in New York City introduced during World War II to keep housing affordable. Rent control aimed to prevent landlords from overcharging their tents. But decades later, the policy has led to unintended consequences. With rents artificially kept low, landlords had little incentive to maintain or improve their properties, leading to widespread despair and deterioration of the housing stock. Furthermore, rent-controlled apartments became scarce, making it difficult for new tenants to find affordable housing. As a result, the policy ended up benefiting a small group of long-term tenants while creating a housing crisis for everyone else. Finally, let's look at contemporary example, Venezuela in the early 2000s. The Venezuelan government implemented price controls on basic goods to combat inflation and make essentials more affordable. However, these controls led to severe shortages of food, medicine, and other necessities. Producers couldn't afford to sell at the low government set prices, leading to a drastic reduction in supply. Shortages again. The country, once one of the wealthiest in South America, spiraled into an economic crisis with rampant inflation, widespread poverty, and millions of people fleeing country in search of basic necessities. So why do price controls fail? The answer lies in basic economics. Price controls disrupt the balance of supply and demand. When prices are set too low, demand skyrockets, while supply dwindles, leading to shortages, shortages, shortages. <laughs> when prices are set too high, supply increases, but demand falls, leading to surplus. In every historical example we've discussed, price controls led to market distortions, black markets, and often social unrest. The intentions may be good, but the outcomes are consistently disastrous. History has shown us time and time again that price controls, no matter how well-intentioned, lead to more harm than good. They create shortages stifle innovation, and ultimately harm the very people they're meant to protect. As we continue to debate economic policies today, let's remember the lessons of the past. When governments try to control prices, they often end up controlling people's lives in ways that lead to economic and social disaster. If you found this video insightful, don't forget to share and like and subscribe for more deep dives into economic history and policy. Thank you all. So listen. Um, this election, I do strongly believe, is about two very different visions for our nation. One, ours, focused on the future, and the other, focused on the past. Let's keep learning from the past to build a better future. Most politicians know what price control does, as a lot of them are not dumb. So you kind of need to have that debate. Are they dumb or evil? 
And if they sugarcoat it to, we will eliminate corporate greed. We will prevent price gouging. We will make goods and services affordable for everybody. It does not change the fact that they are intending to do price control. And the same thing will happen as history repeats itself. What's the best way to end this video than with a quote from my favorite economist of all time, the GOAT, the Michael Jordan of economics himself, Dr. Thomas Sowell. He said that one of the main problems of price controls is to define the appropriate price of what is being controlled. Another quote from him, sellers in general maintain the quality of their products and services for fear of losing customers otherwise. But when price controls create a situation where the amount of demand is greater than the amount supplied, a shortage, fear of losing customers is no longer as strong as an incentive. For example, landlords typically reduce painting and repairs when there is rent control because there is no need to fear vacancies when there are more tenants looking for apartments than there are apartments available.